a lot of club offering. I should say give the Lord a continuous clap offering, not a clap offering, because He is worthy, isn't He? Good morning. It's so good to see everyone here. Uh, we are in the series of Live Uncommonly, so I believe the Lord has put a word in my heart for all of us, uh, every, every single one of us. You know, I, one day I thought about what it means to be in church and part of the church. Actually, I th when I thought about it, I can come to church and still not be in church with brothers and sisters if, we, if I'm not engaged. Is that true? If I'm not engaged with God, I'm not engaged with my brothers and sisters. So it's not just us listening to the word and we've done our duty. But I believe God has a word for us. I just want you to stand to your feet again together with me and pray with me. Pray for yourself. I believe the Word of God is transformational, but you have to apply it for it to be transformational in your life. So I want God to do a transformation in my life and your life. So could you lift up your hands and ask the Lord to speak to you, to speak to your heart, to bring a transformation. Father, I commit myself and my brothers and sisters into your hands and those online, oh God. Father, we are here for one purpose, to seek you, to know you. And I plead the blood of Jesus over us. I ask for your Holy Spirit to lead, direct, and guide, and anoint. Father, I just remove every obstacle in Jesus' mighty name. Your kingdom come and your will be done. Have your own way with us. And Lord, we thank you. We surrender ourselves to you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Praise God. Okay, we, we were looking at live uncommonly. Uh, unto the Lord. Uh, before I go into that, you know, I just thought about uh, Pastor Ernie's sermon where he says that the sons of Issachar understood times and knew what they ought to do. And I believe it's very applicable for churches anytime and every time. Because if you want to live uncommonly, if you want to be people of God, if you want to be in sync with God, walking in sync, in step with God, it is, it, we are not called to walk in sync with the world. We are not called to walk in sync with other people. We are called to walk in sync with God first of all. So if we want to live uncommonly, we cannot be out of steps with God. When we are out of step with God, there is no way that we can live uncommonly. So if I want to be in step with God, then I need to know in every season what God wants me to do. I need to know what I ought to do in God's timing, in God's season. And that's why we have to be spiritually awakened. The church must be spiritually aware. We must be spiritually sensitive to God, to the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. You know, we are in days, the challenges of the modern times is a lot. We, we, are, we have so many, many, many challenges and so many, many distractions. Just entertainment itself. You know, you cannot even count the different types of entertainment and we can be caught in the entertainment. It's not wrong to watch a movie. It's not wrong to, 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 to fellowship with friends. It's not wrong to go shopping. But because we are living in such days that the, that the enemy has inundated the world, with so much of these things, distraction. So as a church, if you don't turn your ears towards God, if you don't turn your heart towards God, if you're not seeking God, you will not hear the voice of God because there's so many voices in the world speaking to you. And you won't even know you're out of step with God. So that's the danger. So today, I'm praying. I've been praying for you. I've been praying for myself. I'm praying that we as a church... Really don't miss out on what God calls us to do. We are uncommon people. We are God's special treasure. We are the holy nation of God. We are the royal priesthood of God to declare the praises of God. We are not common. Now, some people have a problem with that. Say, oh, you know, don't even talk about, you know, the, 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 the people of God as if they are special. We are special because of God. Not because of ourselves. 
but because of God, because of Christ who lives in us, because we are born again, we are a new creation, because we are children of God, we are sons and daughters of God, and that's why we are special, because we are children of the living God, not because of ourselves. So we are uncommon. If we don't if we don't live uncommonly, we miss our call. We miss our call. So as I was praying, I said, God, what does it mean to live uncommonly? I felt the Lord drop four things in my heart, that with four elements that we really need to look at today and incorporate in our lives. Uh, can I have the four points, bullet points up there? All right, so the first point is uncommon consecration to God. If you want to live uncommonly, you have to live with an uncommon consecration to the Lord. Nowhere we can live uncommonly if we are not walking with God. And for us to walk with God, we've got to be consecrated. You can't walk with God if you're not consecrated. Second Corinthians says, what has light got to do with darkness? What has Christ got to do with the devil? Don't be unequally yoked. The second point is uh, not just uncommon consecration to God. We need to have an uncommon relationship with God, an uncommon intimacy. You know, we are, you know, in the days of uh, lukewarm Christianity, casual Christianity, we cannot stay in that place. Casual Christianity, lukewarm Christianity is a dangerous place to be in. That's a place of compromise. That's a place where the Bible says the devil, like a prowling lion, seek whom he may devour. He's seeking for easy prey. He's also seeking for those who are on fire for God, of course. But if you're an easy prey, when God told Cain, uh, Cain, be watchful, sink, crouch at your door, and seeks to devour you. We need a relationship with God. If we don't have an intimacy with God, how do we know God? How do we know his heart? How do we hear his voice? Hearing the voice of God is not just through preaching. In our everyday life, moment by moment, we need to be in the word. We need to be in prayer. We need to be hearing God, not just from somebody preaching to us to us, a somebody, a, a book that we read, or a seminar. You and I need to be hearing God <coughs> because we are already in prayer. We are already in the Word of God. And, and, and the Holy Spirit is able to bring a witness and speak to our conscience. Our conscience, the Bible says, is a light, like a candle, a light of the candle that God sets in our heart. So in intimacy, our conscience is soft before God. You know, when you're intimate with God, and by the way, in intimacy with God, you know, our conscience is easily convicted by the Lord. But if our conscience is not easily convicted by God, that means it's seared, it's scarred, and usually it's scarred by compromise, it's scarred by sin. So the second point is well, seek for an unusual intimacy with the Lord. And fourth point is, all right? The fourth point, let me see my notes. Uh, the fourth point is, the, uh, submit to the uncommon, no, sorry, third point. Submit to the uncommon dealings of God. God deal with us to break us. Listen to me. God deal with us to break us and remake us. Fit for his work. Fit for his ministry. So we have to, be willing to submit to the dealings of God. All right? Don't get bitter, but get better. You know, in the dealings of God, be transformed, not deform. Deform with bitterness. Deform with discouragement. Deform with cynicism. Be transformed. Be more like Jesus. And fourthly, uncommon ministry unto God. All right, the first one, uncommon consecration unto the Lord. I want to read from Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44 to 45. Excuse me. 45, it says, For I am the Lord your God. You must consecrate yourself and be holy because I am holy. <coughs> Excuse me. Do not defile yourself with any of these small animals that scurry along the ground. For I am the Lord, am the one who brought you up from the land of Egypt, that I might be your God. Therefore, you must be holy because I am holy. 
2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 18 says, uh, do not be unequally yoked, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and 18. Uh, okay, there you go, thank you. Do not be un unevenly yoked with unbelievers. Listen to this. What participation is there between righteousness and lawlessness? What participation is there? This is the word of God. And he says, uh, or what fellowship has, has light, does light have with darkness? What fellowship? Some of the things of the world, it doesn't look like dark to us because it looks like gray. But we need to be discerning in our spirit. We need to be walking with God so sensitively that God will tell you gray is black, is dark. All right? And then he says here, uh, what agreement does Christ have to do with Belial? Or what share does a believer have with an unbeliever? And what agreement does a temple of God have with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will live in them and will walk about among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separated, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you will be sons and daughters to me, says the all-powerful Lord. Now, when we talk about being consecrated to the Lord, all right, the meaning of the word consecrate, kodesh in Hebrew, it comes from the root word kodesh, which actually means holy. It actually means holy. But consecrate means to be, to be sanctified, dedicate, be holy, be separated. It means, basically, it means that we are to be set apart as holy unto God. We are not to mingle and to blend in with the world. Yes, we live in the world. Yes, we have, we, we have, we have association with the people of the world. I'm not saying that you be a hermit, but I'm talking about the spiritual stuff. I'm talking about sin. I'm talking about compromise. And God said, be separated. Love the people who do not know Christ, but do not have to join them in the things that they do they didn't know it's wrong to do. But you know, you know it's wrong to do. You, you know, I, I get a little bit concerned. Well, unless you're John Harkey, all right, he goes to the bar to preach. But if you've just been saved and you just got set free from alcoholism, going to the bar to preach the gospel is not a good thing to do. Temptation is too much. All right, the power of darkness is there. So, when it's talking about to be set apart as holy unto God, to be dedicated holy unto God for His purpose. The other thing is, we are sacred to the Lord. God considered as sacred to Him. Now, to understand consecration, I used to think that, oh, when you're born again, then after that, you, you consecrate yourself. And as, as I was doing the solemn assembly this time, the Lord gave me another perspective. Actually, the moment you're saved, God make you consecrated to Him because you're a new creation. You cannot be saved and be your unconsecrated, unsaved self. Does that make sense? The moment you are saved, that's why it's called, it's called born again. You are born again into holy consecration. Through your new birth, you come out a holy, consecrated child of the living God. So salvation... And, you know, consecration doesn't save you, but you're saved into consecration. Does that make sense? Sanctification doesn't save you, but, yeah, but salvation sanctifies you. Salvation consecrates you to God because you're a child of God. So that's why in, in uh, let me read for you uh, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 to 17. He said, for the love of God compels us. We judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live, listen to this, that those who live should live no longer for themselves. That is to be set apart. We, you and I, you know, I no longer live to my desire because I die to my desire and I take on the desire of my heavenly father. And I do the desire of my heavenly father. So he said that, you know, um, you know, that you should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. That means live for him, be consecrated, be set apart. You and I must consider ourselves as holy people. Holy people. Because we are holy, 
we live holy. Because we are holy, we act holy. It's not that we act holy and we become holy. We are born as holy sons and daughters of the living God. Live out what we are born into. A new creation. We are not a old creation. We are the new creation. And I pray today we, we grab hold of this understanding. So whenever you find yourself not behaving the way once you, God wants you to behave, you are not acting in the nature and your, and your born again nature and in your born again character. We got to get back to what we are born into. What is our DNA? Whose DNA do we carry? Whose spiritual DNA do you carry? Or do I carry? Listen, it's only the consecrated church that carries the power, that carries the power to show the world that Jesus Christ is Lord. You know, the consecration of the church carries a power in itself to convict the world of sin. We are not judging them. We are not judging them. By just being consecrated as holy unto God, walking holy unto God, the very presence of God in us, the holiness of God being manifested in us, that in itself will convict the world of sin. Is that true or not true? You know, I was working in the industrial company when I first graduated from college. And we have all those... Uh, bis uh, what do you call it? Salespeople. And there was a manager, and, and some of the salespeople, they were talking, talking. I don't know what they were talking about. Maybe it was good that I didn't know. So I happened to walk into that midst, and one of them looked at me and said, Oops, she's here. We can't talk about these things anymore. I didn't say anything. But somehow they knew. I didn't come on them, but they saw the lifestyle, and they knew I openly confessed Jesus Christ. Listen, if you and I do not live consecrated, we are just like the world. We blend in with the world. Where is the testimony? Where is the light? Where is the presence of God? Where is the glory of God if we as children of God live as the unsaved? We blend in with them. They don't have a testimony to look at. They don't have a, have a voice to hear from the church that Jesus Christ is God. We need that. We need to live that way because God calls us. He, he, he gave birth to us and called us to live that way. And 2 Corinthians also said, all right, that you should not live unto yourself. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Listen, how many new creation over here? How many new creation over here? I'm trying to look. I need to encourage some of you. You are, you are new creation. So you can lift up your hands. I guarantee you, you are new creation. How many new creation over here? Then walk in your new nature. Don't walk as one who is not safe. Don't walk as one who is not born again. No, don't make choices as one who is not consecrated. Don't make choices as one who is not a child of God. Make choices. That you are a child of God. Separate from the world. You know, can I also tell you, Satan hates consecration. He hates consecration. He will do everything to destroy your consecration. He knows that if I can destroy the consecration of a child of God, I can destroy that child. Look at King Saul. Look at Samson, but of course Samson repented. Look at Judas. Judas gave up everything to follow Jesus Christ. But he could not separate himself in one area unto God. Money. Money. And I pray today we all examine our heart, examine our lives. You know, listen. You know, so, so Satan hates consecration. And Satan hates the truth. 
So he will try to contaminate the truth with lies, with deception, with philosophies of the world. We are so open and exposed through, 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 through uh, uh, movies, through music, through entertainment, through, through the internet, to the philosophies and the teachings that are of the world that sometimes sounds good, but they are poison. Because Satan wants, it to, wants to make it to sound good to the Christians. So if we are not discerning, we don't know the word of God, we eat, we, we bite into that fruit and say, mm, it tastes good, but it's poison. It's poison. You see, and when and so this, if I can just give them a, a poisonous concoction of truth and lies, I can take away their consecration. Because the, the concoction that you believe in is what you're going to live by. Yeah. That's what you're going to live by. But it's poison. It's really poison. Now listen. It's not only what is outside is unclean. That's why we need to be consecrated. But the unclean has come into Christian homes through television. Listen to me. Don't, I'm not against you watching television. I watch television sometimes. You know, uh, television, internet, social media, books, entertainment, music, whatever we engage ourselves with has come into our homes through, through I, what do you call that? I A I T? Huh? A I, okay. A I, okay. Artificial intelligence. You, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. <laughs> Praise God. I still get to go to heaven. But it's there. Your computer. What do you watch on your computer? What do you watch on your television? You know, every time if my husband and I want to watch a movie, I will Google for parents' guide. Why? To make sure, it, even though it's PG, there is hardly any good movies anymore. Now, you know, some of the movies that we may say, oh, it's, it's a good movie, it's a moving movie. But listen, and in that movie are things that, is, that the theme of the movie includes things like fornication, adultery. Oh, come on. Come on. So why are you sitting there, looking at the screen, looking at people unrobe themselves, which you in the natural will never do that. Why are you allowing that in, hall, in your home through the television screen? The unclean is no longer out there, it's in your house. What are you doing with that? How about a curse word, the profanity? You know, people talk about, oh, the American sniper. It's a story about this Christian guy who was really... I thought, oh, maybe I'll just... But I discovered there were profanity. I don't blame the one whom they were portraying. I said, I don't care. If it is a Christian movie about somebody, why is there profanity in there? Why are we watching? Why are you exposing your ears that are consecrated to God to hear the profanity, the taking of the name of Jesus in vain through the social media or through AI or whatever you call it? Why? The unclean has come into your family, into your house. And that's why we have to be watchful. What kind of music are we listening to? One time, Pam Seward shared this story. She was in the mainland, and she brought an African pastor, I think, with her or whatever. And the church, the worship leader was on the keyboard playing, playing on the keyboard, and there was a drum rhythm that came out of the keyboard. And this African pastor from Africa put out his ears, look at Pam Seward, and say, you know, that got to stop. That drum beat got to stop. Because that's exactly the drum beat of voodoo, where my ancestors, I know that I came from Africa, we use that drum beat to call out demon spirits. But sometimes we don't know. We say, it's only music. It's only, oh, oh, pastor, that means a lot of things I can, cannot do. But what did Jesus say? The way and the gate is straight and wide, narrow. It is what it is, but it leads to life. It leads to life. So, consecration is of vital importance, okay? Consecrated to the Lord. Let me find my place. Okay, 
Now, the other thing about consecration is this. <coughs> we got to know that we belong to him. We are not our own. You know, when Jesus in Matthew chapter 37, verse 38 says this, the one who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He said, it's not worthy of me. Now, you see, sometimes we read that, but we don't really take it seriously. It's just things that we read. But he meant every word. He said, if you love father, mother more than me, you're not worthy of me. The one who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And the one who finds his life will lose it. And the one who loses his life because of me will find it. This is a passage about consecration only to God. And sometimes being, being set apart, being separated, it's not just from sin. Sometimes there are some legitimate things that God will want you to separate yourself from. Like Samson was consecrated as a Nazarite. He could not touch uh, wine. He's not supposed to touch dead body because he's consecrated to God. Sometimes in your life and my life, there are certain things in your life and my life that God will touch and say, I want you to separate yourself from that. I want you to drop that and don't get engaged in that. And that's what fasting is about. Fasting, we consecrate ourselves. We separate ourselves from food. We separate ourselves from activities. We separate ourselves from TV. We separate ourselves from legitimate things because it stands in the way of a relationship with God. And God, it's not just sin. The things, anything in life that, that becomes a danger to dilute your, your love for God, to dilute your conviction, to dilute your consecration to the Lord. It may be a game. It may be an extracurriculum uh, curricular activity. But if that thing is consuming your time, if that thing is taking so much of your affection and your attention, and you're paying so much time to that, and God is going to say, separate. Because that thing is taking you away from me. Our consecration is the power that constrains us to faithfully walk in the call of God. I repeat, our consecration is the power that constrains us to walk faithfully and committedly to the call of God. That's why Satan hates consecration. You know, I like to do jigsaw puzzle. Let me ask you, is scenery and all that kind of stuff... <coughs> How many of you know that Zizor Pasa is really pretty harmless? How many of you agree with me? It's scenery, scenery, God's creation. Scenery. I love to do jigsaw puzzle. When I was a younger Christian, I would do like a thousand piece, pieces of jigsaw puzzle. And I want of that type that will not go to sleep until the next piece is put in place. I'm a fixer. Uh, I see something out of place in you. I, I just want to go and tweak it and fix it and say, there you go, brother. There, there you go. You're, you're good now. So, so I was spending so much time. You know, I sleep 3 a.m. in the morning. I go to work. And when I get home, I, I'm excited about jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> and one day the Lord told me, stop. Don't touch that anymore. Because it takes you away from me. What takes you away from God? When God say, don't love your father, mother, the more than me. Because he's saying, don't let the love for your dad and mom takes away love for me from your heart. Be consecrated. How many of you want to live uncommonly for God? About 20 of you. One more time. How many of you want to live uncommonly for God? Okay, that's better. About 70 of you. <laughs> How many of you want to live uncommonly for God? Great. Praise God. Because you count. Just don't depend on big names. I thank God for Reinhard Bonke. He's, he was, he's gone. I thank God for Pastor Seward. He's gone. I thank God for all those people who... Randy Clark and all these people, Heidi Baker. I thank God for Heidi Baker, really. I thank God for Pam Seward. But God is saying, that's a you that I want to flow through uncommonly. You count? Pam Seward is not here this morning, is she? Is Heidi Baker here this morning? She's not. But who is? You are. So you live uncommonly and impact the community, the circle where you are at. Who else? If, if, if those people who live within your community wait for Pam Seward to come and preach to them, uh-uh. 
it's not going to happen. So every one of us, every single one of us here, every single one of us here, you have a very important place in the kingdom of God that things that you can do uncommonly for God that I cannot do. Because God said, I appointed her to do it. I appointed him to do it. It's not you, Siu Ping. It's them who is going to carry the power of God in that place. Now, all right, so also concerning consecration, <coughs> all right. Now, one of the things about consecration is this. I'm going to encourage you to protect your conscience. Protect your conscience. Do not sin against your conscience. Your conscience is a gift from God. It's your communication center between God and your conscience, which relates to your spirit also. It's the Holy Spirit speaks to your conscience. So when you begin to shut off the voice of the Holy Spirit, your conscience becomes seared. Your conscience becomes hardened. And if you do not hear his voice, you perpetually keep on ignoring his voice, that conscience, the Bible says, becomes hard and seared with hot iron. And when that happens, it's like a scar. You don't feel anything anymore. And that's a dangerous place to be in. If God cannot convict you and speak to your conscience because your conscience is dead, you cannot change. You can't change. And not only you don't change, you deteriorate. You go from bad to worse. You see, people, we see so many pastors being exposed and all that. Now, I'm not here to, to judge them, but I'm saying everybody has equal opportunity in, 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 before God to change and to be holy and to, to have the Holy Spirit helping us. How did a pastor degenerate so far as to be a pedophile? How did somebody who say that, you know, uh, they started well, how did that happen? Because the conscience is seared when the Holy Holy Spirit start to talk to them. Don't do that. Don't watch pornography. Don't go there. Don't touch this. They say, oh, it's only one time. But the only one time will always lead to the second, the third, the fourth, and the numerous times. It always does that. And there comes a day when a conscience is so dead, you're not afraid to do the most evil thing because a conscience is dead. You must treasure your conscience. You must value your conscience. You must guard your conscience. Do not, do not sin against the conscience that is the light of God in your heart. Because it's a dangerous place to be in that we can no longer be convicted. Listen, the world is pretty dead. The world will do what the world does. But for us, we must live unto Jesus Christ. The church must live unto Jesus Christ. Don't sin against your conviction, which is the voice of the Holy Spirit. You see, when the world cannot be convicted of sin, you see, when it comes to consecration, it's not religious. You know, when you're consecrated, there's an authentic holiness that you keep, that you walk in. You walk in the favor of God because you walk consecrated before God. And then when you talk about consecration, uh, you know, some people say that, Okay, some people say, oh, don't be so legalistic. Don't be so legalistic. That's just a movie. I'm not being legalistic. You see, this thing about being broad-minded is an excuse to tolerate the lack of separation from the unclean. We have to start to understand that. You know, consecration is not being narrow-minded. Consecration is living in the knowledge and the understanding who my God is and who I am in Him. My Father is holy, therefore I am holy. Why is it so wrong? Why is the word holy so unpopular? Why is the word holy like, oh, that's arcade, you know? Uh, at one time, there was a training on prayer. Someone came out and said, oh, when you go out and, and, and pray for the people, don't even mention sin. You can't mention sin. Are you kidding me? If the world cannot be convicted of sin, they cannot repent and they do not get saved. They go to hell. So this is somebody who's listening to the voice of the world. And say, oh, the, the, the people say that we always judge them. First Assembly of God, I thank God we are strong in conviction, but we don't judge. We love people. And in loving people, we can talk to them and say, hey, that's a sin. You know, sometimes, can I also 
very quickly put in this thing. When you have a stronghold, all right? Trust me, I'm one person whom the Lord has delivered me from many, many strongholds. And I thank God for that. For example, if you have a stronghold of anger, or if you have a stronghold of depression, or you have a stronghold of gluttony, pornography, whatever it is, the therapies, the psychologists will give, a, give you a reason why you're that way. And I'm not throwing that out. I believe there is some truth to that. There is some facts to that. You say, oh, you are, you are, my husband used to tell me, you're doing emotional eating right now. I look at him and say, yeah, I am. <laughs> That's giving myself an excuse, you know, emotional eating. You know what was my excuse for my emotional eating? Emotional eating is always you eat far more than you need. And you always eat what you don't actually should be eating. Like chips. What else? Chocolates. How come emotional eating cannot be carrots and celery and spinach? <laughs> Why is emotional eating always chocolates and chips and popcorn? What else? What else is there? How many of you are emotional eating is a big steak? Ice cream. There you go. You see, I know what I'm talking because I was in that place. But you know what was my excuse for emotional eating? It's another day. I'm very tired. I need to be refreshed, as if chocolate could refresh me. Well, that's a new thing. Mm, mm. I'm so refreshed by ice cream right now. Oh, I'm a new person. I can pray for three hours right now. I'm on fire for God because of chocolates. And potato chips. And I turned to my husband and said, honey, buy more. <laughs> but you see, that's my excuse. You know, that's my, oh, end of the day, I, I want, how about watching TV? Now, there's some truth to that. You know, you want to relax, that's fine. You know, now I try to learn one piece of chocolate. One day, I'll get to have a piece of chocolate, and then one, one day, no more chocolate. You don't believe me. <laughs> you are <laughs> laughing. But you see, strongholds. We give, we give psychological justification for strongholds. Oh, oh I, I go into gluttony because I was depressed. That, that is my go-to. It is true. Gluttony, food, temper, uh, uh, breaking out in temper. It gives you a little bit of, uh, at that moment, it's like it, 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 you need a release. You want a release. But then there comes a point of time you have to stop saying those things. You have to look at pornography. You have to look at gluttony. You have to look at temper and look at it and, and don't call it because I was depressed or because I was sad, I was lonely, that's why I default. You've got to s destroy that default button. You've got to stop talking that way. You've got to look at it and say, you know that thing, that gluttony is a sin. That temper, outrageous temper, blowing a top, is a sin. That pornography is a sin. Until you come to the day to acknowledge that, you are not going to get set free. Because it's justified. I'm lonely. I'm depressed. Until you hate it. The truth about this, people, when we say, when I, when I told my husband, I said, nah, I just, I just need to relax. I'm actually telling him, let me continue in emotional eating. I have no thought of changing. You think I have a thought of changing when I tell my husband that? Oh, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just uh, needing to uh, chill. I, I just need to relax, you know? you know. It's like, why don't you go for a walk? Huh? Why don't you go for a jog? Thank God he didn't say that. <laughs> he has lots of wisdom. He knows times and season. But seriously... You see, if I keep on saying that, I will ne never get rid of, of, of my, 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 what do you call it, my entanglement with food. But if I look at it and say, Supin, that's not right. You are going beyond what the Lord wants you to eat. It's not healthy. You are using it to fix your emotion. That's a stronghold. That is a sin, Supin, and it's ugly, and God hates it, and, but you love it. And also, you've got to confess that you love it. You, if you don't confess that you love it, 
you don't get set free. You've got to tell God the honest truth. When, when God confronted Jacob, what's your name? He didn't say, oh, you know, I'm Jacob because my dad, you know, my dad and mom, you know, they named me that. I didn't have a choice, God. I was called Jacob by them. So go talk to them. He just said, I'm Jacob. I'm a conniver. I'm a cheater. So, you know, unless we, we, we recognize that, uh, uh, unless you and I can, can acknowledge, yes, I love food. I enjoy food. I love pornography. I enjoy the pleasure of pornography. You are not going to get set free. You have to come to a place and say, God, I love it. It's a pleasure I love and enjoy. God set me free. I want to hate it because it is what? Sin. You know, one day the Lord told me, a couple of years ago, you know, sipping, don't, don't just be so casual about strongholds. He said, you hang on to your strongholds. You know, you hold on to your strongholds after I've convicted you. You, you are not going to make it because I don't have strongholds in heaven. Strongholds, you can carry your strongholds into heaven. Consecration. Now, the danger of losing our consecration, I better hurry. I have three more points to go. So, the danger of losing our consecration you have no intimacy with God. How many of you want to be intimate with God? You have no intimacy. In a marriage, there's no intimacy between a husband and a wife if there is a third party in that marriage. There's no way. You, you, got, to, you, you got to be faithful to each other. All right? So the other thing is you have no spiritual discernment. When you have no consecration, you have no discernment. You are blind. You are blind. You are deaf. You can hear God. God can speak to you. But you know, I don't think Judas ever, 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 ever thought that he would commit suicide. But he just didn't listen when the Holy Spirit was speaking to him. I believe all the time the Holy Spirit was convicting. I believe Jesus, even at the Last Supper, hinted to him, giving him a chance to repent. But he was too far gone. Too far gone. No spiritual discernment, no conviction. You know, I think about King Solomon. You know, King Solomon was one of the best king ever. Wise. But he ended in a very poor state because everything God tell him not to do, he did. God said, don't marry those women from, uh, from idolatrous country. He married so many. And, and from the one who built the first temple of God, you know, he became also the king who started to build temples to idols. The idols his wives worshipped. And in the end, in his old age, the Bible say, you know, God, you know, Solomon was old and God was angry with him for all the sin and, and, and the lack of consecration. But this is a sad part. It says that, but, but even then, when God was angry with him, but, but Solomon clung to the idols because he loved the idols. That's the danger of having no consecration. Now, in consecration, sometimes we fail. But God is gracious. God is merciful. You run to Him. He helps you again. He picks you up. He gives you the strength. And sometimes say no. you got to keep on saying no, no, no. Sometimes you stumble. Get up again and say no to those things. And soon, in every no that you say, you find yourself walking into freedom. You find yourself walking away from that sin and, and the power of darkness into freedom. Every time you say no. The enemy loses his power over you. So, secondly, uncommon intimacy with God. All right? Uncommon intimacy with God. I'm not going to, I'm going to really run through very quickly. Sorry. Maybe God wants me to talk a little bit more about consecration. Now, for us to live uncommonly, you and I must have a relationship, not a relationship we talk about, an uncommon intimacy with Jesus and intimacy of that nature does not come by impartation somebody praying for you imparted to you it doesn't come by activation somebody pray for you, you get activated it comes from people who set themselves and discipline themselves and sacrifice time to block out uh, uh, everything to seek God to seek God uncommonly to run after God to search out for God you and I must have an uncommon hunger to be intimate with God. That hunger does not come naturally, but it comes from God. Then you say, oh, well, I don't have to do anything. No, 
because it comes from God, therefore we have to seek Him uncommonly because when we seek Him uncommonly, God will start to do the work of hunger in our heart. We're sitting there, you're never ever going to get hungry. People, who, uh, uh, when you talk about intimacy with God, it talks about uncommon prayer life. Uncommonly diving into the Word of God. You need to dive deep into the Word of God. You need to dive deep into prayer. Now, prayer begins as a discipline. Now, if you find that it's hard to pray, but maybe, maybe, maybe there's some spirit, there's some lukewarmness in you. If you find it hard to read the Word of God, you, it, maybe there's some hardness in you. Don't wait to feel hungry to seek God. Seek God when you don't feel hungry for Him. Seek God when you don't feel like you love Him. Seek God when you don't feel like reading the Bible. Seek God when you don't feel like praying. Discipline yourself. Commit yourself. Seek Him. Make yourself seek Him. Kill your flesh. Kill, your, kill, kill, kill the, the, the carnal nature and say, discipline yourself. I will discipline myself to seek God. And when you first open your mouth to pray, it's like sawdust. Five minutes looks like eternity. Eternity. Keep on your five minutes of prayer. And then keep on your next five minutes of prayer. Keep on your next five minutes of prayer. It becomes 10 minutes. It becomes 20 minutes. It becomes half an hour. And over a season of time as you pray that way, without you knowing it, without you feeling it, the Holy Spirit is at work in you without you actually knowing it. And after a season of time, you get up and say, I'm different. I'm not the same anymore. Something has changed. And then you begin to have an appetite for God. So do that. You know, Moses was one of those people in Exodus 33, you can go back and read that, who really sought after God. In Exodus 33, the Bible says that it was Moses' practice to take his tent and set it outside the camp and call it the tabernacle of meeting. And whoever wants to meet God will go there. And it was Moses', Moses practice to go to the tabernacle of meeting. And what happened is this. When he got out from, his, from the camp and walked to the tabernacle of meeting, the, the children of Israel know that. And, and, and Moses, they would... They will come out of their tent, but they are still in the camp. They are not outside the camp. And they watch Moses walk into the tabernacle of meeting from afar. And they, when they saw Moses walk into the tabernacle of meeting, the Bible says that there will be a smoke coming down surrounding, surrounding the tent. And God will speak to Moses face to face. And the people saw the glory of God coming down, the presence of God coming down. They worship God from afar. But Moses worshipped God in the smoke of the presence of God and the glory of God, face to face. What will God not reveal to us? If anything in your life that you want, you must want intimacy with God far more than breath itself. Start today. Start today, all right? Intimacy with God, because listen, when you talk about intimacy with God, your one goal in life, listen to me, your one goal in life is Jesus Christ. Nothing else. Not blessings, not promotion, not a mega ministry. Jesus Christ. You seek Him for who He is. Intimacy with God. There's a difference between the presence of God and the person of God. Intimacy comes from relating with the person of God. You see, over here sometimes, you know, in a worship service, the, 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 the power of God came, the presence of the Holy Spirit comes. And all of us feel the presence of God. But that, that, that does not mean everybody has an intimate relationship with the person of God. We all feel the presence, but not everybody who feels the presence has an intimate relationship with the person of God. Psalms 103, verse 7, the Bible says, To Moses, God revealed his character, revealed his ways, but to the children of Israel, he revealed his power and his deeds. Because they experience God's presence, but they have no intimacy with the person of God. You know, church, if you and I really want to live uncommonly for God, intimacy with God is one of the most important things that you and I need to seek after. To know him. If we are not intimate with him, how do you know him? How can you recognize him? All right? Seek him. Amos 5 4 says, Seek, God says, Seek me and live. In Amos, you know, the children of Israel were so backslidden and God confronted them. 
God confronted them in a few things. One of the things that God told, told, told uh, Amos, what do you see? And, and Amos said, I saw a plumb line. And the children of Israel have built the building, the wall, according to their plumb line. But God said, I'm bringing my plumb line to the church. We are living in days, listen, the word of God is God's plumb line. God will judge us by his plumb line. Not according to what we think or what we say. All right? And then the other thing that God told the children of Israel is, prepare to meet your God and seek me and live. Fourthly, all right? Fourthly, now, uncommon dealings of God. I want to read from Genesis chapter 42, uh, verse 22 to 26, very quickly. Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a well. His branch run over the wall. The archers have bitterly grieved him and shot at him and hated him. But his, his bow remained in strength and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. By the God of your father who will help you, by the almighty God who will bless you with the blessings of heaven above. But I also want to read from, uh, read from uh, Psalms 105. Psalms 105, 16 to 22 is a testimony of Joseph. He said, moreover, God called for a famine in the land. He destroyed all the provision of bread. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They hurt his feet with feathers. He, had, he was laid in irons until the time that, has, that his work came to pass. Listen to this. The word of the Lord tested him the word of the lord tested him all right and then also in in uh, in uh, genesis chapter 4 it talks about his promotion when pharaoh said this so the advice uh genesis 41 37 to 46 so the advice was good in the eyes of pharaoh in the eyes of all his servants and pharaoh said to his servants can we find such a one as this a man in whom is the spirit of god joseph was uncommon he lived uncommonly, and he was noticed by God's orchestration by the most powerful man in Egypt, Pharaoh. And he, and he went on to say, Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning as wise as you are. How many of you are like that? There's no one as discerning as you are. Joseph lived in consecration, we know that. Joseph also lived in intimacy with God, we know that. But all, Joseph was also dealt with by God, tested by God, with challenges, with difficulties, with pain. All right? And he says that, You shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I've set you over the land over all the land of Egypt. And then when he went on, it said, wherever he goes, people would honor him. They would, they would bow to him. How many of you, if you come to the first assembly of God, everywhere you go, everybody bow to you? Come on. From the usher outside to the pastors, they see you, they say, oh, good morning. How many of you can handle that kind of honor? Nobody upset you. Nobody disagree with you. Nobody say bad things about you, but every time they see you, they honor you. Oh, can I pull out a chair for you? Can I get you tea? Can I get you... Can you handle that? Honestly, I don't think Joseph could handle that honor until God started to deal with him and God started to put so much of God himself into Joseph that when the time comes, he's got so much of God in him, God's virtue, God's characters in him that when, when the honor came, he was able not to touch it. He was able not to be corrupt by it. And the other thing Pharaoh said, nobody will lift a hand or a foot without your say-so. Imagine that. Again, first assembly of God. You are not to lift a hand and foot until, uh, until you know, nobody is to lift a hand and foot until you say so. Wow. Even Pastor Cole doesn't do that. Far from it, he doesn't do that at all. What power, what authority. Can you handle that kind of authority? Can you handle that kind of uncommon honor, uncommon authority, uncommon power? Oh, come on, uncommon. 
anointing. Can you handle that? Can I handle that? Until God tests me to break me, to remake me in His image. God break my heart to remake my heart. So I have a heart after God. Uh, he, he break... He break my personality to remake my character so I have the character of God. Then I have the strength of God. I have the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I have the power of the Word of God in me, living strong in me. So that when a promotion comes, I'm not corrupted. I'm not defiled. I am even more humble to give everything to God. Now, some people may not agree with me. Some people say, oh, don't say that you are nothing. But I'm honestly telling people, I say, without Christ, I am nothing. Without Christ, I am nothing. People say, but you, but you, you work hard. The energy to work hard came from God also. It did not come from me. The dealings of the Lord. Listen, Ivia, God tests us to review, to confront, to purge, to transform. Now, in the dealings of God, if you don't let God deal with you, spiritually you become deformed, twisted. The dealing of God is very revealing, purging. And in the fire, the fire purifies us. The fire also forge us, strengthen us, reinforce us in godliness. We have His character, His strength, His commitment. The dealings of God. And when God deal with us, at the end of it all, an uncommon living will be manifested in uncommon ministry unto God. When I say uncommon ministry, I don't mean mega or big. Some people have big ministry, that's God. Some of you may have smaller ministry, that's also God. Not everybody has five talents. <coughs> Some have one talent. <coughs> so I'm not talking about size or anything. You know, you, you think about that. You don't need to be, you know, it's not a big ministry that caused you to shine, shine in godliness. That caused you to, to your, that your lifestyle actually magnify God. It's not that. All right? That, you know, it's uncommon ministry, you know, that you are so like Christ that whatever God calls you to do, there's an uncommon obedience. And God will bring the results. Amen? In John chapter 14, verse 12 to 14 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, this is Jesus saying, The one who believes in me and works, the works that I am doing, he will do also. He will do greater works than these because I'm going to the Father. And when, whatever you ask in my name, I will do this. And in order that the Father may be glorified in the Son, if you ask anything in my name, I will do the greater works that we do is still through the power of Jesus Christ. So it's not myself. So, so it, when, when Jesus said, greater works you shall do, he's actually saying, I will do it through you. So the greater works actually belong to God, belong to Jesus. But we need to leave what? We need to have uncommon consecration. What's the second one? Uncommon what? Intimacy. And thirdly, Submit to the uncommon dealings of God. If you can go, go through a season of pain and failures and, and, and you're doing everything right by God, you know, uh, uh, you lost your job, uh, all this like, wow, why, why is all these things coming? Could the Lord be actually putting you through His season, His process of dealing with you? One of the dangerous things is to be at a place of being not dealt with by God. We resist His dealing and still we want big ministry. I want you to stand to your feet together with me. First of all, I want to find out, is there anyone here that you have not really, you've come to church, but you know you have not really received Jesus Christ into your heart as Lord and Savior? Or maybe you need to, you're falling away from the Lord, but today you want to come back to the Lord. Could you raise your hand wherever you are? Don't be shy. I'm going to pray for you. All right. Anybody here? You need to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you come to church, you're half in and half out. You're not really committed to the Lord. Is there anyone here? I'm going to pray for you. All right. Or anyone want me to rededicate yourself to the Lord? Praise God. Uh, I see that hand. Can somebody stand by our, our brother over there? Hallelujah. Let's everybody pray together with me with this brother. Father, I come to you. 
I acknowledge I'm a sinner. I ask of you, as I invite Jesus Christ into my heart as my Lord and Savior. My Lord and Savior. I give my life to you. I, give my life to you. I repent of all sins. I, repent of all sins. I turn away from the world. I turn away from every evil and Satan. I'm consecrated to you. Put your spirit in me. Make me your child. Write my name in the book of life. I thank you, Lord. I'm forgiven. I'm safe. I'm consecrated. From today onwards, I live to obey you and to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to very quickly pray for us. The church cannot continue same old, same old. You know what an altar call is? An altar call simply means I hear the word of God and he speaks to me and I'm going to respond to the word of God. When you respond to the word of God, you're responding to God himself. I'm not here to coax anybody. But if you want to live a life uncommonly for God, you are, you are so sick of the devil taking advantage of you. You are sick of strongholds in your life. You say today, you, you actually, in your heart today, you make a decision. Answering all the call cannot be flippant. Oh, okay, I'll answer all the call. But right here, if in your heart, some of us need to repent from our lack of consecration. When I prepared this, I had to repent. My lack of consecration, I'm not at the uncommon consecration. I have to repent. My intimacy with God is not that deep. I need it to be deeper. I'm just being very honest and frank with you. But I have this desire, this fire in me that says, I want to be completely consecrated to God. No shadow, no darkness, no mixture. Because I want to live for Jesus alone. I'm done with the world. I'm done with bringing unclean things into my home. I'm, I'm done with compromise. No more. It's, it's a decision I have to make. I can make it for you. But you have to make the decision. And the other thing is that I want the intimacy that Moses had with God. It's also, it starts with a decision. When you come on the call, it's not like, miraculously boom bang you're there but it's a step of submission to God and God can start to work in us and then the other thing is this I don't want to fight against the dealings of God anymore maybe some of you are discouraged you, you're, you're upset discouragement can dull your heart but you say today I want to be like Joseph to submit to your dealings Wherever you are, can you lift up your hands if that's you? Very quickly, we're going to pray. If that's you, in any area that God is speaking to you, lift up your hands. I'm not going to persuade you like I said. I'm not going to coax you. I'm not going to persuade you. You have to want to do it. You have to want to say, Lord, I'm willing, I want. Can you lift up your hands high up to the Lord? Let God seize your hand. Now, I want you to pray. Can you pray right now before I pray for you? Can you pray right now for yourself and say, Lord, if you need to repent, ask the Lord to, to set you free. If you need to ask God to, 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 to really, you know, uh, do a work in you, areas that you compromise, whatever it is, say, Lord, forgive me. Can you do that right now? Speak to God. Open up your mouth all over this century. Speak to the Lord and say, do a work in me, O oh God. Do a work in me, O oh God. Father, help me. Me to be fully consecrated to you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And Father, right now, right now, can you right now begin to dedicate yourself to the Lord and say, God, here I am. I give you my life. I give you my all. I give you all that I possess. I give you all that I am. Father, let your holy fire of consecration flow through me right now. Oh, Father, burn. Burn the fear of God into my heart and my soul and spirit. Burn away desire of for sin. Burn away all God connection with the strongholds burn away every tie that's not of you burn away 
away those things, oh God, by your holy fire because I am completely consecrated to you. And begin to pray right now and say, God, take me into intimacy. Give me a hunger for, come on, pray to the Lord. Don't let me just pray for you. You cry out to God. Lord, help me to have intimacy with you, oh God. Hallelujah. And Lord, right now, right now, and say, God, forgive me for murmuring and complaining when you dealt with me. Forgive me for resisting your testing, resisting your dealing. Forgive me, oh God, in the name of Jesus. And right now, I submit myself to your dealing. Break me, oh Lord. Come on, call on the Lord. Break me, oh Lord, and remake me into who you call me to be, that I can be consecrated to you. In Jesus' name we pray, everybody say, Amen. Give the Lord a clap offering.